Great. So, um, metadharma. Um, this is a topic that I've been exploring on the Buddhist Geeks podcast and have been, have been um, really excited about. I've felt like there's a lot of potential here in this idea. And um, today I wanted to share my kind of working definition of what metadharma is and also talk about the plan for this month in exploring and practicing with metadharma, um, kind of what uh, what the, the proposed agenda is and the kinds of things that I thought would be interesting for us to explore together. Um, so metadharma, my current working definition of this um, is that metadharma is any approach to dharma practice that responds in some intentional way to the meta crisis that we face as a species. And, and this word meta crisis is, is one that I ran across not too long ago. Uh, and really, I think this, this word really points at something useful and interesting. Uh, I heard this from Zachary Stein, who's a, um, a philosopher and an educator. And he, he wrote about this in a, in a book, in a great book called Education in a Time Between Worlds. And he basically points out that we're existing in a time period where we don't, we're not facing just one crisis. Um, and one group isn't just facing one crisis. The whole human species is facing multiple overlapping interrelated crises. Um, we're facing things like the destabilization of our ecology, of the very uh, change in the fundamental uh, nature of our climate and our seasons and our um, access to water and things that are very important for us and other beings like us uh, to live. Uh, and this is accelerating. Um, and then we're also working with uh, growing economic inequality uh, across the globe um, that's causing all kinds of challenges and social problems. And it's been extremely well documented at this point. Uh, and we're dealing with also for those of us that are in countries uh, that are in democratic countries, we're also seeing uh, a rise of authoritarianism across the globe. Um, and, and this is also creating in some cases, very, very serious uh, problems, loss of life, safety, uh, liberty, you know, all of these things are happening. Uh, and they're happening in our own countries also. Um, and so all of these different, we're facing all of these, and I didn't even mention half of the other things, you know, <laughs> the other crises that we're facing. And there are a number of other things that, that we're also working with. And, and what's common among all of these things is that they're currently outstripping our capacity to respond uh, to them. Like we don't, know how to solve these broad scale challenges um and and the and what we've done up to this point I mean, education in a time between worlds in the old world it's no, it, it's it's already been shown to not work and what i think my my reading of what we're experiencing is a kind of crumbling of an old world a dissolving a falling apart of a consensus you know about the way things are uh, and we're, it, in my experience of it anyways, we're staring into the abyss of that change, not knowing how it's going to play out and unfold. Uh, are we going to be able to respond to these crises? Are we going to have enough time? Uh, will we be able to govern ourselves collectively in a way where we can actually respond? Um, are we going to be able to resolve the paradoxes and tensions in our own personal practices in terms of how we relate to these broader things that are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and will we be able to, as some people describe it, um, figure out what's at the root of this crisis, this meta crisis, you know, which many of the people I respect, they, they, they claim that it's a crisis of identity um, also. So to me, that puts it squarely within the realm of Dharma practice and Dharma exploration. This is a crisis. If this meta crisis is also a crisis of identity and of what it means to be a human, um, then I think Dharma practice is a great way to explore that crisis. And there's this um, this really uh, 
sweet Zen story uh, or koan in which uh, a student comes up to the Zen teacher Uman and says, you know, what, what are the, what are the most, the high teach, the highest teachings, the most profound teachings of all the awakened Buddhas and enlightened people throughout time, throughout space and time. You know, what's the, what's the real pearl here? <laughs> and Uman responds to him, you know, an appropriate response, an appropriate statement, like saying something useful. Uh, and he also gives that to the, to the, to the student, an appropriate statement. Um, and, and so for me, the question of metadharma is what is the appropriate response to this meta crisis that we face and how do we actually work with it as practitioners at whatever level that we are working with it um, through our personal lives and how we relate to it through our professional lives and how that intersects with these, uh, all of these challenges that we face um, these, uh, these situations, which if they continue in the same direction that they're going could very well lead to self-termination um, to, as uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger describes this, debasing our society, actually uh, cutting out the, the substrate or the foundation from underneath of us, um, that we're, that we're actually look like we, we have the potential to do that. We have for a while, actually, <laughs> um, you know, at least since the 20th century, we've had that potential nuclear weapons. And here we are uh, facing new existential threats and new global challenges. Um, and the stakes are really high. Uh, and so for me, I don't think the tra traditional Dharma, which didn't have an awareness of these things, and even modern Dharma, which really thought everything was okay, we just kept growing and kept, you know, making progress and kept, you know, applying our rational minds to the problems at hand that we could, you know, any, any problem that comes up is fine. We'll just keep solving for it. Um, but actually that mindset is what in a way has gotten us here because there's been all sorts of unforeseen, um, what are sometimes called externalities, you know, things we didn't expect to happen happened. You know, we didn't expect all the nuclear radiation that came from all the bomb testing in the 50s because we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't expect that if we pulled up all this oil and burn it all, all these dead dinosaurs, <laughs> that, that, our, that our very climate would change. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, and so we're dealing with the unforeseen consequences. And, the, and, and traditional Dharma did not foresee these things either. Uh, and yet, maybe there's something here we can retrieve uh, from Dharma practice. Maybe there are useful practices or orientations. I think like things like the Bodhisattva vow, when they're updated, um, seem to make a whole lot of sense right now. Uh, one of my mentors, David Lloyd, talks about the path of the Ekosafa uh, in his work, Ecodharma. Um, you know, the, I think there's a place for these kind of new expressions of Dharma, which I think of as metadharmas. You know, they're, they're a response to the time that we live in and the, and the unique complexities of it. Um, so this month, I want to start by dissolving the individual self, um, which to me is the, the, the individual rational self is part of it's that philosophy is what got us into this mess. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to contend that's the argument I'll make. And that part of getting out of this mess is dissolving that sense of individually located selfness that we've got to find another way to be um, uh, more like individuals than individuals um, and so and, and I can't remember who used that phrase originally but I learned it from Alexander Bard and Jan Soderquist in their book Synthism um, creating God in the internet age um, you know so maybe we're creating enlightenment in the internet age I don't know that's grandiose but uh, we're rediscovering it for sure. Um, and in the second week, I want to go from that sort of dissolution or that kind of easing a part of the individual self and really work on waking up on dissolving the self, self-identity, moving through the phases of insight, which is a simple contemplative model that my wife and I have co-developed that sort of simplifies some of the more complex maps of awakening uh, or the process of insight or just of learning stuff. 
Um, and we'll use a practice called Big Mind to do that. And I'll, I'll share more next week about that practice. Um, we'll continue with the Big Mind process in the third week as we shift our focus from dissolving the self to um, actually growing the self or evolving the self. Um, so we'll actually look at what happens when our self identity grows and gets bigger. So when we go from an egocentric self, just I, to ethnocentric self, to we, to a world centric self, all of us, to a planet centric self, finally, not just all of us humans, but all of us, everyone uh, on this rock, <laughs> on this living rock. Um, so that will culminate in the experience of the planet centric self of actually exploring from the inside, what it's like to be identified with the planet, with all the inhabitants of the planet. Um, and from there in the last week, we're going to use that as a base for then investigating experience as this planet centric self, uh, or another word for it would be as planetary mind. So as planetary mind, I noticed that there is, embodiment there is release there is not knowing and stability and we'll actually do mindfulness practice as this planetary mind so planetary mindfulness seeing what we notice as that which is identified with and includes all of our of our home 